Tak hezký dobrý večer, vás tady všechny vítám jménem Socialistické Solidarity na našem mítinku o stávkové vlně ve Velké Británii. Moje jméno je Jan Majíček, budu moderovat dnešní debatu. Naším hostem je Mark Tomas, Social Workers Party z Velké Británie, což je sestarská organizace Socialistické Solidarity. A než mu předám slovo, tak bych rád na úvod řekl, že tohle je první z letošních debat. Těch debat bude určitě hodně, protože, jak víte, tak se nám se stávkami roz, roztrhl pitel. Máme tu jednak stávkou vlnu ve Velké Británii, máme tady stávky proti penzitní reformě ve Francii. V České republice z ničeho nic dvě stávkové akce, to znamená stávka dělníků v Nexentire a ve středních Čechách a k tomu stávka dělníků z Voltu, kteří se odmítli podrobovat novým odměňovacím pravidlům, které tato platforma zavedla. No a tohle všechno dává naději, že možná ten rok 2023 nebude tak otupující a tak ubíjející, jako byly ty roky předchozí. A stejně tak Socol bude pořádat další debaty. 18. března nás čeká Mezinárodní den akcí proti rasismu a fašistické hrozbě a v květnu tradiční dny antikapitalismu na které jste všichni zvyklí. Pokud se přišli až teď, tak v Zoomu dole najdete ikonu Interpretation, je to taková země koule. Pokud si na ní kliknete, najdete tam ikonku, která se jmenuje Češčak, Čeština. A když si na ní kliknete, tak uslyšíte Marka Tomase, ale s českým tlumočením, které dělá Marketa Jořicová, za což jí už teď předem děkuji. Tak a já už nebudu dlouho zdržovat a rovnou předám slovo Markovi, So, Mark, floor is yours. Thanks, Jan, and thank you to Social Solidarity for asking me to speak. I think it's fair to say that in Britain at the moment, there's a big feeling that the working class is back as a force, a fighting force in society. And as I'll explain, this is after a long period when it hasn't felt that way, when the working class has often been absent as a real force. And the context for me saying that is that since last summer last year, um, starting with strikes by rail workers, then quickly followed by strikes by postal workers in the post service and telecoms workers, we have seen the biggest strike movement in Britain for decades. I'll give you an example, and it's still a growing movement. It's expanding. Wednesday last week, the 1st of February, there were four national strikes on that day. Around about 100,000 civil servants. So these are people who work in government departments, who maybe pay unemployment benefits, work in departments of education or health or so, but not the senior civil servants, the low paid workers in government departments, they struck. There was about 70,000 university staff at all 150 universities in Britain. There were 300,000 perhaps teachers in schools on strike. And the smallest group, 15,000 train drivers, but they effectively shut down the rail network in Britain on that day. Maybe about half a million workers striking. And most magnificently, across Britain, from the biggest cities to some of the smallest towns, around about lunchtime last week, those strikers came together and marched in very big numbers. For example, in London, the demonstration was big, young, enthusiastic, excited, with maybe 40,000 taking part. One of my highlights was where the march was assembling, out of the underground station, which sadly was not on strike, but a group from one area of London, in West London, where the union, the elected local union leader is a member of our party, the SWP. He came out with about 700 striking teachers behind a union banner with our comrade on the megaphone, leading chants, holding a copy of our paper. It was that kind of mood. I'll give you another example. In a very small town on the south coast of Britain, It's called Hastings, doesn't really matter. Just one example. 400 workers marched in a really small town, joining together. Um, so this is a huge, exciting development. 
But that's not the end of it. That was just Wednesday. Two days later, the train drivers struck again. There were no rail, no trains on Friday in Britain. Today, this morning, I was at a picket line of about 100 nurses in a hospital in central London who were singing and dancing on the picket line. Nurses across Britain are striking today and tomorrow. Also today, I'm hoping this isn't the trans, the ambulance, the emergency ambulance stuff. If you thought someone's ill in the street, the ambulance that comes to get you with the paramedics, they're on strike today. Um, on Friday, Thursday and Friday this week, the university staff will strike again. Next week, the postal, et cetera, et cetera. This is the pattern. And this means that day after day, when you listen to the television news, when you turn on the radio, when you look at social media on your phone, there's a constant discussion and reporting about strikes. Suddenly they're in the news in, in, and in national consciousness. You may not be on strike yourself, but you know there are strikes taking place. Now, of course, a lot of that is the media attacking the strikers, claiming the strikers are greedy, they're all well paid. Of course, we know this. Um, but you also get the voices of national trade union leaders and sometimes of ordinary workers themselves who talk about what's happening in the health service or what's happening in the schools, how things are breaking down, how they're struggling to pay. It's very, very powerful. Suddenly class is being discussed. I don't know if this will be familiar, but one of the developments has been that a, the rail workers leader, a man called Mick Lynch of the RMT union, has become a kind of popular hero or for socialists and trade unionists and people who want to fight back. Because when he goes on the media and is interviewed, and you'll have these people on the BBC interviewing him who are overpaid, arrogant, ignorant, they attack the strikers. And he doesn't apologise. He doesn't say, oh, we're very... He goes on the attack and says, why should people get poorer? We want to fight back. And he's become a hero because he's seen the standing up for working class people. So it's a very dramatic moment. What I want to now emphasise is how big a change this is from what's gone on in the past. And the way I thought I might try to explain this is to talk about the strike figures. The government in Britain every month collects figures for strike days. So one worker going on strike for one day is one strike day. How many are there each month across the whole and next week, they will announce the figures for December. It takes a little time to collect the figures. And I am willing to bet every penny I have, <laughs> not many, but every penny I have, it's quite important to me, that when they announce that next week, we will have reached for last year, two million strike days in total. That's quite a lot. But when you understand that this will be, that will be the first year there has been more than 2 million strike days in a single year since 1989. This is a big deal. I mean, 89, Margaret Thatcher, hopefully maybe people have heard of her. I try to forget her. She was still prime minister. This is 32 years ago. So you get a sense that the level of strikes is increasing. Now, I, I don't want, to mislead people, we have in the more distant past many more strike days. In Britain after the Second World War, we had many more strike days. Give one example, the year at which the British working class was probably at its most militant, combative, with the most victories, was 1972. And in that year, there were 23 million strike days. So we're not back to historical heights, but in some ways that doesn't matter. What matters is people's recent experience. We are having more strikes than almost anybody who is at work currently can remember. It's an upward forward momentum. This is also having an impact on the ideas in people's heads. Like many socialists, especially socialists who look to working class struggle, and I agree with Karl Marx that workers are the key to changing society, it's been a hard argument. People say to you, that's very interesting, but really, hasn't things changed? Isn't what you're talking about in the past, maybe in the 19th century, 
1973, maybe in 1972, but everything has changed. There aren't any miners. The miners used to be very militant. Old industries have gone. What power do teachers have? What power do civil servants have? What We're seeing that they have a lot of power. We've had an argument that says that neoliberalism has changed the structure of work and the working class. People may still go to work, but they don't have a secure contract. They don't have permanent work. They're much more precarious, casual, vulnerable, weaker. They can't fight back. Or some people go even further and say the kind of neoliberal ideas that say you shouldn't think in terms of class or collective struggle, collective organisation, solidarity. You should think in individualist terms about how to survive in, the, in a market economy. Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society. We all have to be individualistic, reject class. That this had entered workers' heads and had driven back older ideas of class, collectivism and solidarity. And there are arguments against all of these. I have arguments. I've had to use them all the time. And you win some people, but maybe others aren't convinced. The difference now is that if somebody says, are you sure that workers can fight back? I don't need a sophisticated argument. I need a finger to point to a picket line and say, there, see. Now, I'm oversimplifying. Of course, there are still arguments, but you get a sense of the big change that's happening at the moment. OK, now I thought it might be useful to maybe just think about why this is happening. Why are we seeing this change now? First of all, let's maybe just, what are people actually going on strike for? What are those civil servants or rail workers and so on? What are they striking for? And one of the big reasons is very simple, for more pay. Let me put that in context. And this isn't just in Britain, of course. I don't know about the situation in the Czech Republic, but in many European countries, Americans, since the pandemic, and the lockdown, especially since the lockdowns ended, everything is more expensive. Prices are rapidly rising, inflation. In Britain, the government says it's about 10, 11%. A more accurate figure that includes housing costs, which is important to working class people, your rent and your mortgage, maybe 14%. Many workers have been offered, who are striking, 5%. And what it means is if you're being given 5% pay this year, um, and told this is wonderful, this is more than we've given, but if inflation is 14%, that is a 9% pay cut. If civil servants, you're being offered 2%, that's a 12% pay cut. That's the immediate thing. There's something else though, and this is quite important in my view, is that since the great financial crash, the banking crisis in 2008, there's been a big change in Britain, which is that Real wages have been stagnating, have not been growing. And the reason I say that's a big change is for Britain, which is an advanced imperialist country and so on. Since the Second World War, real wages, on average, not every group, but on average for workers, was going up. In fact, every 28 years, real wages were doubling. So each generation, of workers, your children will be better off than their children. Oh. A couple of bumps on the road, but essentially from 1945, in even earlier actually, but to 2008, it's like this, wages, right? Or maybe, maybe more like that, but going up, that has now stopped. Since real wages fell after the banking crisis, they were just about returning to where they had been in 2008 when the pandemic started. Then we had the pandemic, now we have inflation. I saw one prediction in a serious newspaper, the Financial Times, that wages won't get back to where they were in 2008 until 2027, five years time. The point I'm making is, is unprecedented experience for many British workers. So there's pressure. Secondly, workers aren't just striking over pay. A lot of the disputes are about what trade unionists call conditions. How hard you have to work, the shifts you have to do. If you work on a Sunday, do you get paid extra? You, many people did, and now they want to take that away. Is working at the weekend voluntary 
or will you be told you have to do it? Lots of these kind of issues. On the railways, they don't want an extra person beyond the driver, the guard. So if there's a crash or a problem, there's just one person responsible for the train. And there's lots of attacks like this. And more generally, we've had 10, 15 years of cuts to services. So in schools, there's less money. In hospitals, less money. And that means that working there is hard, tough, impossible, it feels. And many workers feel frustrated, angry. They want to provide a better service to their children or to their patients. And all of these things are coming together. I think there's another reason, which is the pandemic. In Britain, we had the government, Boris Johnson, very slow always wanted to reopen the economy, couldn't provide safety equipment. We had a very high death rate, one of the worst in Europe. And in the pandemic, many workers went home. But many workers were told that they were essential. You had to still work in the supermarket. You had to still deliver the post. You had to still work in the hospital. You were essential. And the government, every Thursday in the pandemic, would encourage the population, people did this right across the country, to come out and applaud essential workers, especially health workers. And people died. Many health workers, bus workers, people died. What happens after the pandemic? Thank you. No money. On the picket line this morning with the nurses, they, they had a chant, a song. And it was, claps don't pay the bills. You can't pay your fuel bill that's gone up by saying, but people clapped me. No, you need money, right? The people feel a bit betrayed by that. But there's also a more interesting positive impact. Imagine being in a situation in which normally the people whose jobs and status is most important are the people who are paid the most, the people at the top, the accountants, the executives, the top professionals, the managers. Then you have a pandemic. Whose job matters the most? The food worker, the person who collects the refuse, the waste disposal around people's homes and takes away their rubbish, these kind of jobs. So I think workers started to feel maybe we're quite important, actually. We're essential to society. We're more valued. And also, after the pandemic, there has been quite big labour shortages. Some migrants have left, not so much because of Brexit, more because why be in Britain away from your family if you're not working and there's a pandemic and so on. Some older workers decided to retire early. Some younger workers thought, I'm going to stay in education. And what this meant is that some groups of workers who've been striking, like refuse workers, like bus drivers and so on, have a feeling that um, they are necessary, they can't be easily replaced, that you're in demand and that therefore you can push for higher wages. So it's also had a bit of giving workers more confidence, more power. The final point here, I think, it, there is quite a widespread disgust and bitterness in British society at the rich, whilst the rest of us have been suffering. Britain now has 177 billionaires living in Britain, a record number. There are big rises for household energy bills. To heat your house this winter has become worrying how expensive it is. But the energy companies are making huge money. In the news today, Shell, big energy company linked to Britain, has just announced profits of £32 billion. This would pay every nurse, every teacher who's on strike for the next 10 years. So there's a, there's a tension and... and the kind of argument that we get from the media, from the Tories, that it's tough times, the economy's struggling, there's no money. People laugh. They can see the money. It's just that it doesn't get shared equally in society. So all of these elements are coming together. Okay. Now I want to say something about the political situation in Britain in which the strikes are happening. I don't know how much any of you follow British politics. We are on our third prime minister in maybe nine months. First of all, we had Boris Johnson. He won an election in December 2019 in a big way. 
defeated Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. When the pandemic started, there was a bit of a feeling of national unity. Johnson seemed popular. All of that changed. All of that changed. And in particular, the revelations that whilst the rest of society was being told by Boris Johnson and the government, and they passed laws that you had to be at home, that you couldn't meet friends, that people couldn't go to the funerals of their loved ones because you couldn't travel and things, that in Downing Street, where the prime minister's office is, they were having party after breaking all the rules. It created a class bitterness to and you had to go. Then we had Liz Truss, she tried to address the problems of British capitalism. She's free market, neoliberal, Margaret Thatcher. She thought Boris Johnson's government was spending too much money. So she announced cuts to taxes, especially for the middle class and the rich. But the, the what would you call them, the bond markets, the, the, the markets in government debt. But really, they're an expression of the interests of British capitalism, the rich. They didn't trust us. And they broke her government. Normally they do this to, to left-wing governments. On this occasion, they did it to a Tory government. She was only prime minister for 54 days. Incredible. Now we have Rishi Sunak. His political pitch, his promise is that he will introduce stability. He will introduce, it'd be boring, but honest, clean government. So he's not Boris Johnson. He's not Liz Trust. And central to that, is a big programme of cuts, including the refusal to pay more to the striking workers. And one of the problems they have is that people see them as the party of the rich. Rishi Sunak is probably the richest person in the British Parliament in the last 200 years. He and his wife are worth £730 million. Pounds. So when he says, Times are tough. We've all got to sacrifice. Nurses can't have a pay rise. What people think is, yes, times are tough, but not for you. Not for you. He's been getting, he lives in Northern Britain, you know, where he's the MP. He's been getting helicopter flights, to, not the train. But he says it's OK because it's not paid for by the government. He personally has spent £16,000 just this year on helicopter fights. I don't have £16,000 for helicopter fights. You know, why, who is this guy? Different world. Secondly, there is already, and this government is five months old, a smell of corruption around it. He was going to be honest. But, for example, last week, the chair, as they call him, of the Tory party and the former finance minister had to be sacked because... He forgot to pay five million pounds in tax on a big share deal. And then when this came out in public, he suddenly paid it. Now, could you find five million pounds to suddenly pay a tax bill? These people are living in a different world. But that's also occurring in a context of quite big problems for British capitalists. I talked about the pressure, the squeeze on workers' pay, but this is part of a wider picture. All of European capitalism is struggling. Britain is struggling more. It has very low levels of investment, business investment. It has low levels of productivity, which is how much each worker adds to production. It's falling behind its rivals. Where does Brexit fit in here? I should say that the Brexit has been a very polarized and divisive issue very strong feelings on both sides. But the people who were supporting Brexit, by and large said, if Britain leaves the European Union, everything will get better. British capitalism will boom, workers' lives will improve. This hasn't happened. The people who said Brexit is wrong, said it would be a catastrophe, a catastrophe. That's not really the case either. I think Brexit has done some damage to British capitalism. British capitalism is part of global supply chains. 
the European market is one of its biggest. It's made it harder. It's made it more difficult. I think Brexit has added to the problems. It shouldn't be seen as the single big problem. It's made it harder alongside these other deeper and longer standing problems. So the government is quite weak. If you look at opinion polls for the last year, it's been 20, 25 points behind the Labour Party. Next year, there's a general election. At the moment, you'd say the Tories are going to lose this. However, what about Labour? I don't know, again, if people are familiar. We Two years ago, but Jeremy Corbyn was the leader of the Labour Party. When he was leader of the Labour Party, thousands and thousands of people joined the Labour Party. There was huge enthusiasm. How are we going to get change? How will things improve? How will working class people lives get better? We will do it by electing Jeremy Corbyn. This is what the view was. Now, Jeremy Corbyn is not allowed to be a Labour MP. He's been removed as a parliamentary representative of the Labour Party. The new leader, Keir Starmer, is moving very fast to the right. He has expelled thousands of people from the Labour Party, including Corbyn. And because he wants to say to British capitalism, we've changed. We're not a threat. We're safe. We will defend your interests, British capitalism. You can let us into government. This is his strategy. And on the strikes, that's meant he has told his spokespeople, do not go to a picket line to be seen to supporting the strikes. This has caused a lot of tensions. The rail leader I mentioned earlier, Mick Lynch, who's been popular in the media, when he makes a speech, he always says, which side are you on? Do you support the workers or the bosses? And he means Keir Starmer. And the interesting thing is everybody claps because that's how they feel angry that Labour isn't supporting the strikes. So what this has meant politically is that three, four, five years ago, the hopes for change, the left in Britain was focused on Parliament, the Labour Party getting Jeremy Corbyn elected to be the next Prime Minister. Today, the focus is on struggles happening in the workplace outside Parliament. And that has increased the space for the radical and revolutionary left to talk about our vision of how collective struggle is the key to change. Now, the last things I just want to talk about is to say everything is not wonderful. There are tensions in the strikes because although we've been having strikes since last summer, the big strikes, rail workers, post workers, nurses, now the teachers, all of them have not won their demands or even something good that almost their demands and the reason for that is that the leaderships of the trade unions are quite conservative and so the kind of action they're calling is too limited a one-day strike then wait a month another day or even where they've increased the rail workers the post had quite a lot of strikes then they stopped and don't strike for two months, hoping to get a better deal. And this is too limited. The Tory government is just hoping to ignore the strikes, wear them down, pass some more anti-union legislation and hope it goes away. In the SWP, in my organisation, and we have comrades around the country who've been going to picket lines, very friendly response from the workers on strike, selling socialist worker. But we have been discussing how they need to, the phrase we would use is escalate. What about more strikes, longer days, shorter gaps to increase the pressure. And we call indefinite, you know, no end date. If you just go out till you win or you collapse, right? We've been saying this is the kind of action we start to need. Now, this is a learning process. For example, when you talk to rail workers last June, many of whom had never been on strike before, They'd say, we'd like you, thanks for your support. This is great. Everyone should strike together. No problem, yeah, everyone thought that. But strikes for longer to escalate. Oh, I'm not sure, maybe not, too much. But over time, as the months have gone by, there's more of an audience for saying, there's a problem here. We're gonna to have to have a more 
radical response. And this is the kind of argument that we've been putting. In other words, you have to talk, you can't just celebrate the enthusiasm and the power of the strikes. You have to say, how do we win? How do we have a victory and have a debate about strategy and how to fight for that? We don't just talk about that. On the picket lines, it's very interesting. Working class people, not necessarily all on the left and so on, but on strike, you can talk about climate change. You can talk about Palestine. You can talk about Ukraine war. You can talk about the revolt in Iran, all of these questions. But in particular, the question of racism, because the Rishi Sunak's government is seeking to mobilize hostility to refugees in particular. We have refugees who come across the English Channel in small boats. It's very dangerous and sometimes people die because there is no legal safe route. And Rishi Sunak says, stopping these people, this will make your living standards improve. It's a horrible racist argument, right? So we've had to seek to raise anti-racist arguments on the picket line. We have an important anti-racist demonstration in March the 18th in Britain. We want to draw in unions and strikers to that demonstration. The strikes that are happening are multiracial, black and white, Asian, Muslim. It, they're incredible. So racism is a threat to those strikes. So the strikes, it's a slow recovery of working class confidence and power. We as socialists are finding a new audience in those strikes, but we want to link the strikes to wider political questions of social transformation. So it's an exciting moment, but it's also a moment that requires clear politics and socialist organization to try to help that process go forward. Okay, that's enough for me, I think, for the moment, yeah, anyway. Okay, thank you. I would like to start with the first one. So one of our participants is asking, that there are some news about dying in hospitals because of strike. So could you comment, how is the situation? Is there some emergency in hospitals during the strikes? And what is overall situation in your healthcare system? This is the first question. So if you can answer it. That's a good question. Yeah, obviously strikes in the health system. When postal workers strike, I don't get a letter. Health workers the consequences, obviously, people worry about emergencies. So what the, the nurses do and the ambulance do is that they, they discuss a level of what's called emergency cover, minimum in key parts of the hospital. In the ambulances, this also involves that if a call comes in on the picket line, the ambulance workers discuss it and obviously things are an emergency, some are not. If they decide it's an emergency, they leave the picket line and go to the emergency. But they decide, the workers decide. And this is not just for this strike, this has been a pattern in the past as well. The government attacks them and says, you're harming people, what are you playing at? This is dangerous. But there is a very powerful response by the strikers and the union leaders, which is they say every single day, all those days, there are no strikes, 350 days of the year, whatever it is, people are dying in hospital or because they can't get to hospital because the cuts to the services are so bad. And in other words, why do you only care about people's health when there's a strike? If you care about people's health, you'll be putting more money into the health service, including paying staff, because they are very short of staff. There's a big crisis because they don't pay enough. So it, it's a quite effective. And as a result, the evidence from say opinion polls is that the public agree with the strikers more than they agree with the government. Oh, thank you. So there is another question they who is following British politics quite in details because there is a question about if uh, Mark could comment on how socialists are organized within unions. For example, how did the left organize to ensure Kevin Courtney became the general secretary of NEU? 
So maybe if you can explain for everybody who is Kevin Coutney and what is NEU Union? Okay, yeah. So the NEU stands for National Education Union. So it is the school union, or one of them, there's two big ones. The NEU is the most militant. It maybe has about 400,000 members and about 300,000 of those were involved in the strike last week. It's an interesting question. The SWP, our organisation, has members in that union. There are other socialists as well, like Kevin Courtney. Kevin Courtney, by the way, 25 years ago, was a member of the SWP. We train people quite well, right? He is also a very good anti-racist. He spoke at an anti-racist conference on Saturday. And our view is that we encourage SWP members to be part of the union, to take part in the union, to try to build the union, and to try to raise arguments in the union about the need to collectively fight back, to strike. For example, in Britain, there are very restrictive laws to make striking harder. And one of those is that people have to vote at home, not at work, at home by post to strike. And you now have to get not just a majority voting for that, but at least 50% of members have to vote. The Tory party would not be elected on this basis as, as government, right? But in a, for a strike, you've got to do this. That means a lot of work. Our comrades take that very seriously. They are very much part of trying to get the vote out. And they do it through collective organising, calling meetings, putting a strong argument, putting time and effort into organising for a fight back. So to give you an example, this is just between us. Okay. In the National Education Union, they have about 200 branches. Right? I happen to know that the branch with the biggest turnout of members voting for the recent strike was in West London and it's led by one of our comrades that the one I mentioned at the beginning leading that march I also know that of the top 10 where they got the highest turnout six or seven the local leadership of those branches are our comrades so they get their hands dirty they get involved but they, we try to encourage the idea that you also have to raise bigger political questions, not just pay and conditions, Palestine, climate change. Um, if there is a demonstration about climate change, can you get other members of your union to come on the demonstration with their union banner? Another example, in London, there was a demonstration for transgender rights. We organized get 14 different NEU branches to come on that demonstration each with their banner and some of the young trans activists who met not involved in the trade union were wow, wow why have you come you're demonstrating that working class organization is relevant inside of that the party we regularly gather together our members of a different union. Zoom is very helpful here, by the way. So at eight o'clock my time tonight, nine o'clock yours, we are having a meeting on Zoom with probably 60, 70 members of the National Education Union. I had one smaller with members of the Civil Service Union last night, except so we try to organise and discuss our strategy and but also to sell our newspaper at union events to find people who agree with our broader politics too. Is that helpful? Does that sort of address some of that? Yeah. I think so. Okay, Mark, you mentioned anti-union. As far as I know, it was, it has been prepared by Liz Trust, but finally put in discussion by Rashi Sunak. So could you comment a little bit on the impact of, of this law on current strikes or maybe on discussion of the strategy of trade union? So this is the latest anti-union law. We had one in 2016 that I was just talking about how you have to have 50% of people vote. This is not yet passed by Parliament. 
but it will do so in the next weeks and months. And it's called the minimum service level law. And what it will do is it says, of course, you should be allowed to strike. But we also have to protect the public from the disruption, right? It's going to name different sectors like the rail service, the health service, schools, firefighters who've just voted to strike as well, and say, you can go on strike, but a certain number of trains have to run. A certain number of staff have to go into school, this kind of idea. And the, the union must agree to this. So obviously the aim is to make the strikes less effective because if you strike and no trains run, it puts a lot of pressure on the train company or the government. If you strike and during the busy commuter times in the morning and after work, 50% of trains have to run, of course it makes it easier. They lose less money, there's less disruption, the government can hold out. How do the unions respond? They say, this is ridiculous, it's undemocratic, it's outrageous. What about a minimum service level when there's not a strike, given how bad it is in the health service? But do you know what we say is, you're absolutely right, but so what, it will become the law. You have to break the law. They are terrified of doing that. Because if you do break those laws, they're worried that the government will impose financial penalties on the unions and they'll lose money. And if you lose money, you can't pay your office staff, your officials and so on. And so they always, op they complain and complain, and then they act within the law. And as a result, the law has got tighter and tighter and tighter um, over the last 30 years. And it's gonna make striking less powerful. So one of the, so we have to argue at some point, you have to break the law. Workers in Britain have done this before and successfully. I just add one small point here, which I didn't touch on. As well as all the big strikes that were happening and many local like bus workers in one city going on strike and so on. There's also been some strikes that are a bit less legal, if you want to put it that way, a bit more outside the law. For example, last summer, for the first time ever, we had strikes at Amazon warehouses which you probably have in the Czech Republic, there was no union. When workers at one Amazon warehouse had been told they were gonna get a pay rise and the managers came in and said, good news, you're going to get a pay rise. And it was going to be 35 pence. So 35 pence out of a pound. And people went, they walked out. No ballot, no telling management, they just walked out. And this then spread to seven or eight, we think, other warehouses. This is the kind of action we're going to need to see more of if we want strikes to be effective. Thank you. Another question is from Martin, and he is asking, how does the strike wave change the atmosphere in your party as the BUP? Does it does the party grow? I think it's had a very good impact on the atmosphere. If you're my age or older, You've been waiting 30 years. I joined the SWP in 1989, the year I mentioned the last, when Thatcher was still around. And I remembered the miners strike and all these big battles. And I wanted more of them, but this time we would win. It's been a long time. So I think our comrades feel very excited, very motivated. People are getting up to go to picket lines, sometimes two or three times a week sometimes more than one picket line nobody moans everybody's happy even when it's cold and I think for newer comrades if you have joined as a student for university you and other student supporters of the SWP have been able to uh, make a banner students support the strikes and march maybe just 10 15 of you but march to a picket line of rail workers or postal workers and when you arrive, they clap it. So when we talk about the working class has the power to change society, it feels more real at the minute to people. This is a political education. Um, how have we done on the picket lines? I think it's, as I said, three, four years ago, everybody joined Labour, apart from us. 
Labour Party members who would come to our meetings and say, I like the SWP. You're very active. You're very serious. I'm very impressed. You should all join the Labour Party and help us to fight for Jeremy, right? We didn't. Now it's completely different. Nobody says join the Labour Party. Why would you? They're attacking the strikes. So the argument that radical change comes outside of Parliament, outside of the Labour Party, and it comes through workers' struggles, has been boosted. And it also means there are a layer of people in the working class movement who are open to our politics, more open. And I think the SWP has a new audience of working class activists on the picket line. Let me give you one example. There was a moment in November when the rail union had said they were gonna have three or four days of strikes and they called them off because the management said they would talk to them, not to give them a new offer, just to talk to them and they called them off. And socialist worker, within two hours, had an article saying this was a mistake, this was wrong, they shouldn't have done it, the strike should have kept on, this isn't how you win. And because comrades had been visiting picket lines, right around the country, we had SWP members who had in their phone, the phone number of one, two, three, maybe five, maybe more, rail strikers in all the different cities with WhatsApp. I don't know if you can anyway, but everyone loves WhatsApp here. And so they were able to send the article to these people. And I said, because I help organize this, please tell me what response you get. And I knew that this was one of the first times when some of the rail workers were unhappy with their own leadership, a, a gap had opened up. Because so many people told our comrades, I agree with the article, you're right, scandalous. It's a, does that mean they all join the SWP? No. We have recruited some strikers, and that's important. If we have three rail workers, and now we have six, this is good, right? It's not enough to influence the whole dispute. But we have picked up teachers, bus workers, civil servants, because we're also more visible. So it, it's modest, but it feels like we have more workers listening to us and a layer of workers joining the SWP. This is quite an important development, I think. Okay, thank you, Mark. I don't see any more questions here. It was great to hear your experience in a break. As I told you on the beginning, before the official part of the meeting started, in Czech Republic, we have a new let's say strike wave as well and factory and in and workers of the world so hopefully we will all see the more strikes and more workers struggle and i wish you good luck with all you are and other comrades you are doing and i hope to see you soon with more news about victorious strikes in okay. britain thanks Anna. thanks to all the comrades who joined the meeting tonight take care bye-bye <laughs> Thank you.